Good morning. I'd like to uh, welcome you to the plan. I want to thank uh, 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 Nicola for his kind uh, lecture to come and speak here again <coughs> this year at the plan. Um, it's, it's a very exciting uh, prospect to see architects present their work, and so I'm, I'm very happy. And I was also very thrilled about the topics that were suggested and, and uh, <coughs> accepted the idea that we would speak under the uh, prospect of quality envisioning a better world, um, <coughs> which is um, certainly a daunting topic, but one that architects, I think, are very deeply involved with. <clears throat> this comes under several uh, categories in the work I'm going to show today in an array of projects, uh, some very small, some somewhat larger, um, that touch on the family, touch on uh, the idea of society and the collective, uh, talk about the, the community in a way that I think um, <clears throat> you'll see will unfold in, in some very different uh, very different propositions. The first project I'm going to show <clears throat> is a family of four relocating to New York from Europe. Um, in this case, uh, the, the prospect was a, an apartment which was already renovated. And as I've done for many years, and many of my clients <clears throat> have designed custom furniture for them. In this case, <clears throat> the, f the uh, family of four relocating uh, after living in several different places in various parts of the world. Of the significance to the theme under consideration, the family in its many and various forms is the universal basis for society. <clears throat> Every aspect of private and public human interaction asserts ideas about constructed environments. In this case, <clears throat> they are dining room uh, furniture, <clears throat> custom fabricated chairs, <clears throat> dining chairs made of, of uh, of woodwork in lacquer and uh, lacquer and gold leaf, uh, with beautiful uh, fabrics, set up in uh, in rather conventional architectural uh, suite of rooms, but here uh, configured with uh, with elegant cabinet work, very much configured with artwork that belonged to the family, uh, to to have the domestic life. Of, of the uh, family unfold. It's always been my sense that the, the interior is the place where the living history of architecture unfolds. It's the place where domesticity and program meet with the most intimate aspects of family life. And the artifacts that are uh, part of the family uh, become the memory apparatus within which people recall the lives they've led in the places they've lived. Uh, it, what, it's what appears in photographs other than the people. Um, and the memories attached to those forms are significant. In this case, the, uh, the uh, dining table is a Portaro Italian stone with carved uh, black granite uh, bases, uh, lacquered woodwork, um, here you can see with, uh, with uh, a lot of ornamental details in the structure of the table. <clears throat> uh, you can see the um, integral gold leaf uh, with the lacquered furniture. And the integration of ornament and decoration in the tufting of the, of the cushions of the, uh, of the very comfortable chairs. And the gold leaf inlays in the black uh, dining serving cabinet uh, directly behind the table. We also <clears throat> designed uh, the bedroom furniture in these rooms. Uh, these are uh, 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 made in uh, plywood uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, clear lacquer, uh, uh, color lacquer over them, inlays of, of ornament uh, around the headboards to the bed, small nightstands. Uh, and it was the opportunity, as was uh, suggested by the owner, that each of the cabinets be somewhat different. <clears throat> each of the cabinets um, not really be an on, totally an ensemble, but to really take the opportunity to explore different materials and different, uh, different textures. In this case, uh, olive ash burl uh, veneer on a cabinet that opens up and unfolds with uh, drawers and, and doors. <clears throat> and you can see the, the um, 
the ornamental character and the, the heavy texture of the burrow with the inlaid uh, walnut uh, joints at, at the end. In the son's room, uh, this is, um, uh, again, uh, uh, lacquered plywood um, with, uh, with very beautiful, uh, it was an opportunity to really work with, uh, with the uh, cushions, with the uh, tufted headboards, <clears throat> uh, a level of comfort and domesticity that uh, uh, was a welcome opportunity. Um, you can see the array of fabrics uh, that were uh, that were integrated into the into the uh, design of the bedrooms. Uh, <clears throat> the level of finish was uh, was uh, really exceptional, and uh, here the cabinet works somewhat different than the uh, daughter's bedroom. Um, you can see much much larger, much more vigorous, <clears throat> um, uh, but equally explorative in its material. Uh, nature, the master bedroom, and again, the, the each of these pieces of furniture uh, was configured with uh, art from the owner's collection, so that each piece of artwork was selected with the design of each of the bedroom furniture pieces. Um, uh, again, with different fabrics in each room, the TV cabinet, which um, which allows the television to uh, come up out of a uh, out of a cabinet, so it's not visible. Uh, and a very elegant joinery in detail. In this case, uh, with um, with bird's eye maple veneer and walnut inlays. Furniture design has always been integral to the interiority of family life, whether communal or in private space. <clears throat> so, in conclusion, architecture has the potential to construct environments of genuine grandeur and that serve and elevate the experiences of family life. The challenge is really to accomplish this goal with modesty, sustainability, and environmental responsibility. Next, I'd like to revisit a project for a community center in Brooklyn, New York, from the perspective of uh, the architectural strategies to help a community heal and acquire resilience. This community center project is adjacent to Saratoga houses in the Bed-Stuy area of Brooklyn, uh, New York City. The site was once described by journalist Jake Mooney in the New York Times as violent ground. Mr. Mooney was referring to the site as the setting of the tragic death of 11-year-old Kelvin McGinnis in the summer of 1999, shot to death on the site that's outlined in green. Kelvin was an only child. He lived in the 16-story Saratoga Village apartments with his mother, father, and grandmother. Kelvin's mother ran the lunch program out of the community center, located at the time at the base of the Saratoga Village Apartments, the tower you see on the right-hand uh, side of the slide. One summer evening, Kelvin and his friends had played a game of basketball, and they were sitting on a concrete bench in the blank courtyard, talking, when three men rode on bicycles across the intersection of Saratoga Avenue and Hancock Street. The police later explained the men spotted a rival gang member in the courtyard. They opened fire. Several bystanders were injured. Kelvin was hit in the head by a stray bullet and died instantly. Kelvin had just graduated from the fifth grade where he played drums in the high school band and, and he was excited about going to middle school. His friends described Kelvin as a well-respected boy who would, happily, who would happily stop whatever he was doing to open the door for an elderly neighbor. Shortly after this, <clears throat> the client agency, New York City Housing Authority, assigned me uh, the project to remodel and update 1,500 square feet of community spaces on the ground floor of the aging Saratoga Village to add a 3,500 square foot facility, which was to include one all-purpose community room, a kitchen, bathrooms, director's office, spaces for storage, plus landscape design for an adjacent green space a new playground on the rock bottom budget of slightly less than $300 a square foot, the standard expenditure. The Tenants Association representatives in the Sar of the Saratoga Houses Community Center helped me to interpret the program further. You see some of them uh, pictured on the left hand slide. Um, you also can see three, uh, uh, two members of the NYCHA, uh, of the NYCHA organization, David Burney 
in the middle, who was the director of design at the time, William Russo. David Burney, I'm happy to say, is here in the audience. David, welcome. Um, uh, David, when he called me to say we had the commission uh, in his phone call, said to me, I have good news and bad news. He said, the good news is um, you have a project from NYCHA. The bad news is you have a building from NYCHA. Um, it was a public agency. It was a challenge. Uh, but an, an immensely rewarding uh, project. The Tenants Association um, uh, were very excited and clearly responded to the, to the uh, material uh, palette of the building. Um, you can see here in the organization of the floor plan the, uh, a portion of the footprint of the, uh, of the tower of the building which held the existing community center and then our new addition to the building, which really was going to now provide an enclave to the site, <clears throat> no longer the the uh, open blank, um, uh, open blank urban space uh, between the tower and the existing buildings, but really to to begin to provide an enclave on the interior part of the of the site, which would allow people to be protected uh, from from the street, open to the Saratoga Park on the next block. They really clearly responded to the brick and stone material that we ultimately used in the building, uh, an elongated iron spot brick, uh, mahogany door, doors and windows, uh, a cream colored uh, casting stone, limestone. Um, here you can see pictured the connection of the new community center to the housing tower uh, just to the right with its entry courtyard now connected to the housing tower uh, entrance. Um, here you can see from the corner the progression of spaces, and this is a very small building um, that, that uh, I was able to configure out of the program um, to allow for a, a movement from the corner through an entry sequence. Um, and you can see also here uh, we replaced the windows um, in the existing community center with the new windows uh, similarly used in the, in the new building. Um, and the, that small intervention, that very small uh, detail, um, as you can see, transforms even uh, a relatively banal building um, to provide uh, a much richer vocabulary, a much better uh, uh, quality uh, to the architecture uh, that was really worth doing. You can see also how comfortably the building fits into its context. It was very important to me that we uh, that that the building was not an alien object um, imposed into a landscape of masonry, predominantly masonry buildings, but that it was in fact made of similar materials. Brooklyn is is really known for a very high level of masonry construction uh, from really from the end of the 17th and 18th century through the early part of the 20th century. And it was important to me that the building uh, become part of a landscape of public architecture um, in New York. The, reconfigure, the reconfiguration of the site in particular was seen as a healing gesture and to enliven the blank space around the housing uh, superblock. And here you can see uh, the entry courtyard, the director's office in the center, and the main entrance to the building uh, just uh, off to the right. The design is one for safety and two for durability, including resilience against vandalism, which is a clear fact of urban life. Windows were raised high ab enough above ground to avoid breakage. Bulletproof glass was required in the door and window frames of the lower windows. And even the durable wood frames made of mahogany for windows and doors, instead of the more typical steel sash, uh, really talked about the utility of these kinds of, of uh, uh, pieces of architecture, which had been used for centuries in buildings, certainly in New York, um, which were incredibly durable, repairable, and able to sustain uh, the, uh, the life cycle of, of buildings. Inside the community center, there were decorative panels uh, made from uh, super ply sim, super strong ply sim panels, as you'll see. Here, another view in the exterior garden, looking at connecting the building to the housing tower. 
Um, here you can actually see that connection. You can see the new window into the into the computer playroom for the kids uh, and the and the uh, the connector uh, hallway, which which brings the uh, new building into the old building. A view from the interior of the computer room out into the, the public garden and play area behind the window frame. The connector, and here you can see uh, the doors and windows that begin to, what you see on the outside, uh, the heavily recessed windows to produce shade from sun. Uh, the inside, a very elaborate uh, palette of, of woodwork and ply sim panels uh, here in the director's office or in the, uh, in the waiting room uh, before you go into the center itself. Um, which is a room that had to be celebratory uh, both for after school activities, morning play areas for preschool kids, um, and it's used on weekends uh, for, uh, for residents to rent uh, uh, for, their, uh, for their very special uh, activities like uh, uh, birthdays uh, and other parties. Um, Um, here you can see uh, the view of in the garden uh, from um, uh, uh, at dusk with the lights coming on in the building, and you can see the richness of the palette of material. Again, done on a on a uh, New York City Housing Authority budget, it was possible <coughs> to do a, uh, a re very sustainable building. And it's very important to note that the main issue in sustainability is the durability of the building, the ability for the building to last for a very long time. So well-made buildings. And it was really a credit um, to David and the Housing Authority to uh, really go down uh, a very wonderful path and, and build a very durable masonry building as part of the Housing Authority. And here you can see the two contractors uh, who, who built it, local, local builders uh, from, Brook from Long Island City in Brooklyn, um, who uh, were very actively engaged in the process uh, and, uh, and were really responsible for the high level of craft uh, that the building sustained. Since the completion of the Saratoga Avenue Community Center, <clears throat> sponsors and hosts programs for community members of all ages, including the Saratoga Urban uh, Agroecological -eco Center. Uh, this is a, an urban garden of approximately 15 different fruits and vegetables harvested throughout the year adjacent to the community center. The program is run in collaboration with a neighbor not-for-profit not -for -profit organization called the bed uh, Campaign Against Hunger. Uh, uh, just uh, very close by um, to the community center. Founded in 1998 as a small food pantry uh, operating out of a church basement, uh, the organization took on a mission to address a lack of access to affordable, healthy, fresh food, sometimes referred to as an urban food desert. And here you can see uh, what has now been referred to as an urban food de desert, uh, mostly junk food, packaged food, processed food, not very healthy, uh, not good for most people. Um, and the bed campaign against Hunger has grown to become now the largest food pantry in the borough of Brooklyn. Um, they are located, and this is an aerial view of, uh, of uh, Bed-Stuy. You can see the community center uh, right here in the foreground. And just off about three quarters of a mile uh, directly uh, east of the community center is the location of the Bed-Stuy uh, campaign against hunger. Every day, the organization increases the availability of quality fresh food in the community. It grows its own food. Uh, the urban garden produces thousands of pounds of fresh produce and fruit and farms uh, thousands of eggs. They have chickens uh, that lay eggs every day. The basic staples of a well-balanced diet to tens of thousands of low-income families each month. In 2014, the bed campaign against hunger distributed approximately 3 million meals, which is an extraordinary achievement. You have to also understand that bed is adjacent to Brooklyn Heights, 
Um, the two zip codes are one of the wealthier zip codes in New York and one of the poorest. The bed uh, uh, uh demographics are, are really uh, excruciatingly impoverished. Uh, and so this is a very necessary, uh, very necessary um, not-for-profit institution that helps people to eat well. Um, we had the privilege of, of doing some minor interventions for them. Um, their methodology uh, supports human dignity as much as uh, nourishment. Clients are supported by a staff to select fresh fruits and vegetables, organic meats, and other staple items at the bed Super Pantry. You can see here the uh, greenhouse, um, which uh, is on the right on the site adjacent to, the, um, to their main office. And here you can see there, uh, they have three locations. Uh, the one in the middle where you see people waiting online, uh, the client services uh, center. Uh, there's a, an open space right next to their building, and then the super pantry, which is uh, right here, where uh, people come in and food is actually uh, distributed. Um, people wait online for sometimes for hours. They can uh, get food with food stamps, uh, or if they don't have food stamps, food will be given to them. Um, we were asked. Uh, uh, Sorry, clients are supported by staff to select fresh fruits and vegetables. The super pantry, according to their own uh, to their own preferences, much the same way that they would if they were able to afford shopping for food at the grocery store. So there is a rather uh, wonderful collection of uh, food on the inside, and I here show pictures of the super pantry. Uh, people that talk about food, uh, people are are helped to understand about healthy nourishment, fresh vegetables food combining, uh, animal proteins, vegetable proteins, um, how those things go together, uh, uh, pasta, carbohydrates, uh, also with, um, <clears throat> uh, with uh, fruits and vegetables. So it's, it's, uh, this is really uh, a really wonderful uh, operation that goes on. We were asked to renovate new space for the organization to alleviate the need for people to watch uh, for long periods of time outside online to register for food services. You can see here pictured on the left the spaces we found it on the right through our minor interventions. Um, uh, we were also asked to design a community kitchen for food preparation classes, community meals, and fundraising events. Um, you can see here how important the intake is, the uh, client services portion is is uh, intimate people uh, talk about their uh, about their circumstances so uh, these workstations are very crucial to be comfortable to be welcoming and friendly um, as as people really begin to uh, talk about their their means and their ability to feed their families uh, um, the uh, you can see people waiting online so as They've unfolded, um, um, as the project unfolded, they were able to rent more space on the second and third floor of the building across the street on Hull Street uh, in, in Brooklyn. Uh, and this was really very important because, uh, as you can see on the left side, the uh, long lines uh, were, were really, in, in the dead of winter, very harsh for people to wait outside in the cold. Um, again, the, the workstations are very simple. They're, they're simple cascading walls which allow privacy and openness simultaneously. You can see um, one, of the, uh, one of the members of the, of the uh, bed -Stuy organization with one of the live chickens. The director's office directly behind. You can see the director, Dr. Melanie Samuels, in the middle with some of her staff. And uh, here, the uh, very important demonstration kitchen uh, under construction in which uh, 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 classes are held. Uh, people are invited in, both young and old, uh, to uh, learn how to cook food in a way that uh, some people in the community have, have really not had access to. So they're taught about cooking fresh vegetables, they're taught about 
pasta, they taught about preparing meats and, and, and vegetables, about a balanced diet, um, all done in a great ambiance, in a wonderful uh, setting. And you might ask, why is this an important project? Right now, the United States has the highest rate of obesity in the world, mostly due to diet-related factors. The financial cost of obesity is in the hundreds of billions of dollars a year in healthcare expenses and a diminishing quality of life for increasingly unhealthy generations of people. The benefits of this project are tremendous. Families and community groups who ordinarily uh, do not have access to healthy, fresh, affordable food, have an opportunity to learn about urban gardening and farming skills. The local economy benefits from uh, additional jobs and revenue from sales of fresh vegetables, fruits, and eggs. And fresh produce is readily available uh, to every client. Here you can see uh, Dr. Samuels, uh, my wife on the left, uh, Dr. Ann Valentino, who was a, a collaborator on the project uh, and two of the staff and uh, and uh, of course fundraising is terribly important and here you can see one of the fundraising events um, held in the demonstration kitchen with chef Justin who's a celebrity chef um, who uh, donates his time uh, to the bed campaign against hunger um, uh, to uh, to help alleviate uh, stress um, the Greek Diner is probably also one of the oldest institutions in New York for serving very healthy food. Uh, this has been around for uh, many, many years. Here you can see one on the corner of 28th Street and 7th Avenue, the Greek, the Greek Corner Diner. Uh, we were commissioned uh, to look at the renovation of the Greek Diner. Um, as he was upgrading and looking at his, um, uh, his healthy food options, um, he felt uh, the decor, which was at this point uh, 30 or 40 years old, um, was tired, really needed a look-see. You can see the interior of the uh, projecting box on the uh, south side of the, of the building. And you can see one of our studies uh, for a new copper-clad uh, 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 enclosure. The interior... Um, we did various studies uh, for him with uh, uh, transforming um, his diner into more fresh food, uh, a, a different array of, of food products uh, with a demonstration kitchen in the front, uh, in, in some cases in the front, some cases in the back. Um, you can see the, the plan layout in, of tables and counter space, the demonstration kitchen uh, running along the, uh, the back of the slide, a lot of the interior layouts with custom furniture, uh, uh, cabinet work, custom lighting, <clears throat> and then elevation studies with different degrees of openness and closure. Uh, uh, finally, the uh, one of the uh, more final versions of the project, and uh, of course, down to the detailing of the of the building. Um, we've also been working on projects in other towns and villages. This in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. Uh, Doylestown is the county seat of Bucks County in the state of, of Pennsylvania. Its origins date back to the 1730s when Edward Doyle and his sons lived in the area. In 1745, William Doyle built a tavern so travelers would have a place to rest, located on what's now uh, the northwest corner of Maine and State Street. The village was first known as William Doyle's Tavern, and it later became known as Doylestown. Today, the buildings in the town along Main Street are a collection of many fine examples of Lake Victorian federal and colonial architecture. <clears throat> Recently, the village invited architects to submit ideas for the design of a new theater on East State Street next door to the historic county theater, which you can see uh, located uh, with the signage uh, right there on the left, a building that was completed in the 1930s and later restored and reopened as an art house movie theater. The new design utilizes uh, the county theater entrance through which patrons have access to the county theater and onward to the new auditorium in an addition which we designed. You can see here um, the uh, the site, which was allocated, your design goes there. 
Um, the new design utilizes the county theater entrance through which patrons have access to the county theater and onward into a new auditorium, uh, an upper floor event space and commercial office spaces on the second floor. The design proposes a symmetrical masonry uh, facade um, adapted to the scale and form of the county theater. You can see here the plan uh, configuration, the entrance through the, uh, through the existing theater, uh, a left turn into the new theater. Uh, the theater is, is set back beyond the, the two double door openings. And then uh, there's a stair goes up to the second floor to the uh, community center and, uh, uh, and offices above. Uh, here you can see the elevation of, uh, of the building, uh, adapted to the scale and form of the county theater. It's designed in the same ruddy shade of brick that many of the existing 18th and 19th century buildings are in in the community. Um, we felt strongly that it was important for it to be in harmony with the neighbors. Generously arched uh, windows and casting stone lintels and inset mahogany windows, frames and doors really help connect this building um, to the uh, neighboring buildings of the community. Uh, a very intricate set of, uh, of details and ornament, um, uh, which uh, I think um, we as a profession need to revisit our idea of making buildings that are alien uh, to every environment we, we find. Um, uh, in this case, great pains were taken to find an appropriate scale and, and material palette that would blend and still become an original piece of architecture. Four pairs of doors are framed with stepped uh, stone lintels and embellished with geometric plate glass windows for, as the means of egress from the new theater and also to enhance the pedestrian experience. Uh, a little uh, tinkering came from an abstraction of the Art Deco style county theater seen in, a, in the wide rectilinear stone cornice and inlaid exterior edge details. The overall outcome is of a building of presence and specificity that lends a well-measured amount of dramatic flair to the bold blue and yellow facade of the Art Deco style county theater. And equally importantly, the proposed design is adaptable to maximize the options for adaptive reuse, um, uh, which will allow the building to minimize the risk of new the new building falling into obsolescence. The last project I'm going to show uh, very quickly is a project, um, as all of these are, very special and important, but this um, in New York City for the Italian American Museum of New York. Um, uh, this is a, a scene on Mulberry Street um, in the 1800s. Um, since the 1880s, the Italian immigrants have come to live in New York in record numbers. Um, they have thought of themselves collectively as a small Italian colony. Uh, in New York, uh, they were pretty much encapsulated in two areas in the immigration to New York, one in Little Italy, which was the uh, denser one, the second in the east part of Harlem, uh, above 116th Street. But it's really um, the Mulberry Street, Italian Little Italy, that became the symbol of Italian-American immigration into New York. Um, uh, thousands and thousands of, of uh, Italians came to New York between 1914 and 1928 in record numbers. Many remained in New York City, uh, lived in Little Italy for most of their lives uh, until uh, the children uh, migrated out of New York and formed micro-communities in their new neighborhoods. The Lower East Side of Manhattan straddling Canal Street still defines the boundary of a community that has come to be um, uh, come to be uh, known as of, as the Little Italy, the most renowned Italian-American community probably in the United States. Uh, you can see here the push carts and the vendors which lined the streets of Little Italy. Uh, and finally, the uh, uh, Banco Stabile in New York on the corner of Grand and Mulberry, which was uh, is now the home of the Italian-American Museum. Um, it's uh, the bank occupied this site for I think 60 years uh, by the Stabile family. Um, they provided uh, and uh, provided some commercial space like this uh, for the music store next door, and you can see how that has been transformed um, into today's uh, Little Italy, which is 
uh, still a connection to the historic traditions of, of Little Italy, uh, of course, with a lot of new uh, renovations uh, within, uh, within that environment. The buildings as we found them in the, in the uh, red and green paint, a rather dilapidated uh, condition. Um, we've restored the building, uh, uh, reconfigured uh, the ground floor spaces. They still have uh, rental tenants above. Um, you can see uh, we were able to reconstruct and, and save a lot of the ornamental features of the existing bank building, uh, including the teller's cages, uh, the bank vault, and, and many other artifacts connected within. Um, here you can see uh, just some of the eccentricities in the architecture, the, the uh, uh, windows showing some of the artifacts, the domestic artifacts that are contained within the uh, within here, the original sewing machines uh, of one of the seamstresses uh, who worked in the neighborhood. Here, one of the teller's cages uh, with uh, some of the uh, machinery. Um, the, other, uh, the other thing that, that occurred uh, throughout the, the life of the museum um, was that they sold steamship tickets for passages for Italian Americans to go back and visit their families, or in fact, a book passage back to Italy after uh, if people missed home and wanted to return to Italy after the unification. Um, a lot of Italians did return in the 30s and 40s. So their activities were not only banking, but they acted also as, um, as uh, 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 almost uh, uh, steamship uh, bookers uh, for the site. Here you can see there's Mr. Staboli, uh, his portrait. Uh, these are the, tell the original teller's cages. The vault, which contains all of the original paperwork uh, that was still left in the bank um, when the director took over and, and the building was turned over to the Italian American Museum. The records uh, that were kept there were rather compelling. Um, here, again, you can see Dr. Joseph Schelsa, who is the founder and director of the museum. My wife, Dr. Valentino, uh, who has also been a collaborator on this project, looking at the midwife book, the record of, of midwives who delivered Italian-American children, uh, both in New York City and in Brooklyn. Uh, uh, that's an original document from the 1800s, uh, which listed the names of the family, the uh, occupations of the parents, uh, their ages, uh, the names of other children, a very, very beautiful handwritten record of this. A lot of the other artifacts really speak to the, to the testament of both travel and work. That shovel is the shovel that was used by the original Italian workers who dug the subway tunnels in 1900 uh, by hand through New York City in record time uh, through the cut and cover pro uh, prospect. It was a simple wooden shovel made by the made by the Italian Americans with a with a metal shelf, and of course, the valise uh, with the tags for the the for travel. Uh, in this case, back to Naples. We did several uh, studies for them for different hanging uh, prospects. Uh, uh, we dug out the lower level, lowered the basement um, down uh, so they would have adequate headroom in the lower level. And uh, of course, here you see the restoration of some of the ornamental metalwork, the uh, the um, uh, the name of the of the bank, the Italian American Museum, and finally uh, uh, the nighttime view, which uh, we were able to to get some lighting. Again, this done on a on a very modest uh, uh, budget, uh, but um, uh, again. Uh, it's important to know that the Italian American Museum is a tribute to the history of Italian American community in Lower Manhattan's Little Italy and, and to the Italian colonies of Manhattan's East Harlem and West Village, later renamed Soho, as well as every other uh, immigrant group. The Italian American Museum of New York preserves the heritage of Italian Americans uh, for future generations through exhibitions, cultural programs, and a collection of artifacts which has continued to expand. Thank you.